Hello to everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you at the second online lecture within the project LIDMAC. The project um, is entitled East European Literary Magazines 1945-2004, Testing the Boundaries and Paving the Way to Democratization. The project is led by the um, academic press Belletrina and in, it includes nine institutions from six countries. The project is financed by the European, European Union. Today, we are going to listen to three lectures. The first one will cover the situation uh, in Poland. Uh, it is uh, an inter uh, overview of press, uh, of Polish press for freedom. Uh, and it includes uh, writers in exile, second and second and third publishing circuit. The second lecture will focus only on the second circulation uh, magazines in Poland, so it uh, regards also the situation in Poland, whereas the third lecture will give us insight to uh, the Lithuanian uh, literary magazines and more precisely, it will be discussed two uh, magazines, Pergale and Sietinas. Uh, we will start now, um, I, um, and maybe I will add that I will uh, introduce each speakers before their uh, lecture. So the first lecture uh, is uh, prepared, has been prepared by Professor Michał Kopczyk from the University of Bielsko Biała in Poland and uh, with my small cooperation and I will help the lecture, but uh, I ask Professor Kopczyk to address a few words to our audience. Uh, Michał, you are, you are muted. Okay. We cannot hear you. Okay, so maybe I will start the presentation and Michał will be, Professor Kopczyk will be listening to us as well. And um, maybe in the meantime, the problems with uh, your microphone will be solved. So let me now to share my screen. Okay, I got a message from Professor Kopczyk that he says hello to everyone. And uh, yeah, <laughs> if you have questions, maybe the questions will be uh, answered after the uh, lecture. Um, so this is the title, as you can see, a Polish Press for Freedom, Writers in Exile, the Second and Third Publishing Circuit, an overview. So let's let us begin with the situation with the um, with actually this this uh, the picture of the the borders of Poland before so they are in orange uh, color marked in orange color and after the Second World War why because we before the Second World War there were two very important uh, at least. Um, cities, Vilnius and Lviv, or Lviv, which were also um, a seat of uh, Polish intellectualists. And then after the um, Second World War, um, there was a dramatic change of borders, as you can see. So you all know the Polish in today's, uh, <laughs> in today's shape. But uh, it was, a, as, as I said, dramatic change, uh, not only of, because of geography, but also because of uh, intellectual life. Um, the historical conditions that shaped the political and cultural life uh, in, on Polish lands after World War II were conducive to forms of communication that constituted an alternative to the ones supported or even accepted by official authorities. What seems characteristic and distant, distinct from the situation in most other countries of the so-called Eastern Bloc is the significant influence of writings coming to Poland from East Western Europe. The considerable scale of wartime emigration reinforced 
after the war by successive waves of refugees led to the creation of quite a wealth of institutions remaining in constant touch with the Polish language and culture. Not all of these institutions were interested in maintaining contact with communist Poland. There were those who understood their patriotic obligation in terms of refusing to accept the political situation that emerged from World War II. This strategy may be illustrated by the milieu of the Association of Polish Writers ab Abroad and of the Wiadomości Weekly, the magazine, published in London. In the background of these initiatives was the Polish government in exile, which, although not recognized but by other states and also Poland, was a continuation of pre-war authorities. On the other extreme, one can find those who find those whose goal was precisely to strive the influence of their countrymen back to Poland to shape their thinking about the situation in which they found themselves. In this respect, a key role was played by the Paris-based Kultura, in Polish called also Kultura Paryska, founded and led by Jerzy Giedroyc. So you can see him here on the uh, picture and Kultura, uh, the magazine. In this respect, uh, I'm sorry, associated with liberal right wings, wing cycles before the war, Giedroyc represented those of progressive intellectuals who had chosen emigration, but refused to abandon all influence of the developments in Poland and abroad, and proved far more open to the reality of post-war West than the London milieu presented in the previous slide. The magazine created by Giedroyd Kultura, it was a quarterly first and then later monthly uh, issued, gathered those authors who while remaining in constant di dialogue with the intellectual life of the era, attempted to develop a re realistic political project from, for Poland. This project included room for Poland's Eastern neighbors, deprived at the time their subjectivity as states. We are thinking here about Ukraine, Belarus, Belarus or Baltic states. In Giedroyd's vision, the creation of independent states beyond Poland's eastern borders would guarantee its safety and be a condition of the political stability of the entire region. This conviction was not popular at the time, however, not only because it seemed impossible in the situation of unquestioned dominance of Soviet Union, but also because many Poles abroad refused to accept the shape of the borders established during the Yalta Conference, which I showed you uh, before. Time has proved Giedroyd's right in both his political and literary choices. His thought became an important inspiration for Poland's Eastern politics after 1989. The pluralist spirit of Kultura became part of the pluralist canon of contemporary Polish culture, in which there was space, there has been space, for as diverse individuals as Witold Gombrowicz, Gustaw Herling Grudziński, Czesław Miłosz, and others that you can see at the picture, uh, at, at the slide. Another important magazine of that time was the Annex Quarterly, active in Sweden and London later. It came into existence thanks to Giedroyc's support in a sense expressed in his philosophy of operating open to authors from both sides of the Iron Curtain. For over a decade, it constituted an important forum for exchange of thoughts, a laboratory of laboratory <laughs> lab of ideas whose participants had the opportunity not given to most of authors collaborating with Kultura to participate actively in the political life of free Poland from the 90s onwards. Enzyszyty Literackie, founded in 1982 by Barbara Torulczyk, who was a head of the editorial board, 
had a different profile, far more focused on issues of culture than Annex and younger, since it was established and run by martial, martial law and Greece from the early 80s. The magazine soon gained renown as an important discussion forum, especially lively in the 80s, on the identity of Eastern and Central Eastern Europe. Over time, the magazine gained the rank of the most important voice of Polish emigrant intelligentsia after the Parisian Cultura, publishing texts on the heritage or European tradition, contemporary authors and classics, it played an important political role. After the breakthrough of 1989, it, the editorial board together with Barbara Toronczyk moved from Paris to Warsaw, where the, um, where the magazine had been uh, published until 2018. Editors of magazines publishing the immigration had to face a number of difficulties, the most important of these being certainly material deficits and problems with uh, effective distribution and difficulty of reaching the Polish audience. They were, or the audience in Poland, they were, however, free of the main limitation which made development of free press in Poland impossible. And we are talking, of course, about their censorship. In 1977, the milieu, the milieu of, of Annex published Black Book of Censorship in Socialist Poland, an academic analysis of rules binding for every censor. Many copies of the book were successively transported to Poland, which allowed the reading public to realize how oppressive and harmful the mechanism was was. The reaction was common outrage, visible even within the establishment. The situation coincided with an initiative of dissident cycles, uh, circles of funding independent publishing enterprises, a sort of equivalent of Samizdat that functioned in that time in the Soviet Union. And the independent publishing uh, movement was named Second Circulation or cir Circuit, and this will be the topic of the next lecture. However, let us uh, mention the most important um, magazines. So the most important magazine was Zapis. It was published by the um, underground publishing house Nova in Polish Niezależna Oficina Wydawnicza. And um, the magazine uh, published materials that were rejected by censorship and did so under the author's real name. So it was a really important thing um, and which was significant and groundbreaking. Personal details of the members of the editorial board were also made public and these were people known and valued in literary and both in literary and academic cycle, circles. Late 70s were marked by the creation of number of magazines, which, although they could not compete with official press in terms of print runs or effectiveness of distribution, but they broke the monopoly of the authorities on having an opinion forming voice. It was at the time that such magazines since was, were created as Quos Spotkania. You can see them here. Puls Index Critic, Critica Respublica Meritum. Um, let us mention Nagos. Uh, it was an interesting undertaking created since uh, 1983 in the milieu of Krakow's writers and researchers of the Jagiellonian University. Each issue was, on the one hand, similar to a group author's evening, like re reading evenings. And on the other hand, it was an imitation of printed literary magazine. Meetings were usually held in the portrait room of the Krakow Catholic Intelligentsia Club. Many of the texts that premiered in Nagwos were later published in the underground press and emigration magazines. Since 1988, the magazines has already taken the form of a published issue. And now, uh, 
The final decade of communism in Poland passed under the sign of gradual pluralization of cultural life. The spiritual space, which used to be carefully guarded by keepers of ideological correctness, began to be penetrated more and more by ideas both politically indifferent and openly hostile towards the regime. Most came from the West and were related to the counter or subcultural movements blooming there at the time. Gaining legions of supporters, they demanded expression and hence naturally enforced the creation of communication media. This communication was facilitated by technological developments such as photocopiers or Xerox and audio and video tapes. This enabled access to means of communication, enabling at the same time the expression of points of view beyond social custom, marginal in their interest and frequently considered revolting. The 20 year olds of the time less and less frequently identified with the dis dissidents' efforts. What is more, they were increasingly uninterested in politics as such. Critical of reality, they were not anti-communist in the same sense as their parents engaged in solidarity and fighting against regime. Their own involvement turned towards activities that might be described as alternative, with the largest group being music fans, especially pop punk, rock, uh, hard rock or heavy metal. The development of these movements took place within the authorities silent consent because these were perceived as a means of relatively safe discharging young people's energy. One of the spaces where the young generation expressed their stance on the world was the spontaneous publishing movement which initially associated musical events, happenings and or demonstrations. It became most popular manifestation of the phenomenon that came to be known as third publishing circuit. This publishing movement was dominated by the forms called zines or fanzines from the English term fan and magazine. As defined and defined, they were defined as magazines created by individuals or group connected with specific worldviews and interests uh, such as music, ecology, fantasy, comic books, even sporting fans and art, subcultures of course as well. Um, magazines created by proponents of uh, the later were called art zines, although clear distinctions are certainly made difficult by the way that young artists understood these basic categories, not only breaking the divisions between high and low and low art, but also questioning the fundamental opposition between art and non-art. This is why it seems justified to point to affinities between the phenomenon being described here and avant-garde movements of the early 20th century, especially Dadaism, Futurism and Surrealism. A special mention is certainly merited to, uh, merited first and foremost by the magazine Brullion issued in Krakow and Warsaw. Firstly, due to, due to, to the high quality of material published, the founder and editor of Brullion, Robert Pekieli, gathered a group of authors, most of whom proved to be extremely talented, which in time led to identification of the generation of artists born in the early 60s as the Brullion generation. And you can see some names here. So these included Marcin Baran, Manuela Gretkowska, Miłosz Biedrzycki, known very well also in, in Slovenia. Also Andrzej Stasiuk, very well-known uh, writer, Natasha Gerke, Marcin Świetlicki, Jacek Pociadło, Izabela Filipiak. The, these all names are very well recognized in the literary uh, field. Recognized writers and critics of the older generation were also happy to appear in the magazine in Brullion, which um, 
also published translations of classics of the world literature, commentary, materials that were bold in terms of politics and morals. This variety of aesthetics, generations, worldviews, etc., the slight anarchic leaning proved to be the making of the magazine's success. This was not a commercial success, obviously enough. It was manifested in unquestioned influence on literature, promoting a circle of artists who would reign the literary scene in the following decade, becoming contemporary classics. The third circuit fulfilled its task on Poland's way to democracy as an expression and a reinforce, reinforcement of cultural diversity and decentralization, announcing the coming of the reality that Polish readers would face in the 90s, which would find an <clears throat> adequate metaphor in the image of a supermarket with its blurring of the border between artists and consumers. Third Circuit magazines found it difficult to enter the mainstream culture in free Poland, although it's hardly surprising, considering the niche alternative character of most of, of, most of those, in especially in opposition to official culture. But the history of literary magazines in Poland is the history of their struggle, struggles against a new opponent, which after 1989 was the free market. For many, this opponent proved too strong. Only some magazines were successful in their transition from the underground and becoming fixtures in the la landscape of Polish culture in the 90s and later. It is a paradox, although perhaps this is just an apparent paradox, that the greatest success fell to magazines without any past in the second and third circuit. The determining factor was therefore not the dissident ethos, but financial and institutional support. This, however, is a whole different story. So thank you for for the for, for intention. So I'm saying that in the name of mine in, and Michał Kopczyk's name. <laughs> and now let me introduce the second speaker, um, the second uh, and the second lecture. So the um, second speaker's name is uh, Cecilia Kuta, Professor Cecilia from the Institute of National Remembrance and the Pontifical University of John Paul II. And the lecture's title uh, sounds The Role and Significance of the Polish Second Circulation Magazines in the Years 1976 to 1989-1990. Professor Cecilia Kuta, the floor is yours. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes. we do. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the conference. Uh, it was very pleasure to take part in it. Uh, so um, publishing without the permission of the communist regime in Poland in the years 1976-1990 is called the second circulation, independent publishing, underground publishing, and censored publishing publishing the void of communication a bit and publishing the circulation. The terms tissue paper, the boa and samis that are also used. Notwithstanding the terminology, the connotation is always the same. Publishing books, editions, various prints, which due to the system of the communist censorship were issued without the permission of the authorities and were often critical of the regime. Uh, the character of the publications was political, historical, literary, social, cultural, and religious. Uh, in Poland, in the second half of the 70s, publishing magazines as part of the second circulation became a distinguishing feature of the era. Their number, variety, circulation, and scope were exceptional not only in Europe. 
Apart from periodicals, which supplied information, there were many magazines on culture, literature, religion, as well as magazines for youth and children. The second circulation in Poland emerged in response to the censorship policy of the communist authorities. From the moment they took power in Poland, the communists tried to control public statements, including those in print. The production and distribution of paper and printing, uh, printing equipment was subject to the state monopoly. Those who attempted to issue independent publications were arrested. The first magazines, which saw the light of the day without the permission of the authorities, appeared when the anti-communist opposition emerged in the second half of the 70s. The magazines, uh, Communicat and Bulletin Informazione were published from the autumn 1976 by the Workers' Defense Committee, heralding the era of the independent press in Poland. Uh, following its footsteps, Overmilius started to publish periodicals, mainly news magazines. Soon, when the first hunger for information was satisfied, uh, there were other papers of various characters and correspondent to mindful tests. Uh, in Warsaw, writers and poets who were restrained uh, by censorship founded the first independent literary magazine, Zapis, uh, whose first issue came out in January 1977, uh, which we saw uh, in previous uh, lecture. In which the literary milieu started to publish false uh, magazine, uh, whose uh, first, first issue came out in October 1977. Uh, before long, there were publishing uh, initiatives dedicated to specific social groups. An important role was played by a magazine published by the Students' Committee of Solidarity after the death of Stanisław Pejas, a student dissident from Krakow. The most famous were Index, Bulletin, Podajdalen, Signal, as well as Spotkania, the paper of young Catholics in Lublin. Later, their experience was used by students' independent press and culture which was rapidly developing in the 18th. Uh, the beginning of a new period of the independent press in Poland began with the strikes of summer 1980, the birth of the independent self-governing trade union Solidarity, and then its students' counterpart, the Independent Students' Association. An important role during strikes in August 1980 and later was played by small news sheets passed from hand to hand and informed about the current situation and nourish the conviction that fighting the regime was right. Without them, it would be much more difficult for the, uh, for the intimidated nation to unite. Even though some of the publications issued before August 1980, Stop it coming out that there uh, was a huge number of new magazines, bulletins, and announcements that came out not only under the banner of solidarity. Relative freedom during 60, uh, 16 months of the legal existence of solidarity contributed to such state of affairs. The need for one's own periodical, which would endorse freedom of expression, was extremely strong. From 1980 till 1981, there was a flood of company and trade union titles. Journals were published by shipyards, factories, miners, building combines, offices, academic institutes, universities, committees, union, unions, uh, associations of combatants, students, and pupil groups. Uh, there were also periodicals for rural committees. Almost every professional group had its own title. They came out not only in big cities like Warsaw, Krakow, Wrocław, or Gdańsk, but in smaller towns as well. The characteristic trends of the second circulation magazines were 
covering my fault subject being authentic and describing reality without lies, which were typical of official publications. The subject matter of the underground press was not only current issues regarding living conditions, trade unions and opposition's milieu, or fighting for a better future. Independent periodicals were forum for free speech exchange of views, polemics, commentaries, and internal discussion. Magazine issued underground distinguished themselves by graphic design, printing technique, and the level of the content. Graphic design of some magazines was unusual thanks to graphic artists and painters associated with the second circulation. The Martial Law, declared on 13th of December 1981, was a blow not only to the opposition activists, but to the publishing movement as well. The internment of journalists, editors and printers, closing down of printing houses and uh, the resulting difficulties weakened the second circulation. However, it was not suppressed, the need for free speech turned out to be stronger than prohibition and restriction of the martial law. Actually, the, re the reality of the martial law made the underground publishing necessary because the hunger for information was stronger than ever before. This was a challenge to the underground publishers and printers. The independent press became the only, only weapon in the fight against the regime. It not only supplied information, but was a visible sign that the opposition did exist. It gave hope that authorities would not quench this power in the society, which was the result of solidarity. The printed world became the symbol of freedom and one of the ship assets of the underground. In the first months, of the martial law for the underground publisher spreading information was a priority. That is why printing books and periodicals of a more diverse character was no longer in the spotlight. Given the restriction of the martial law, the distribution of smaller publications was much easier than distribution of books or bulky papers on culture. The first independent papers of the martial law, all kinds of bulletins and news sheets appeared just after 15th of December among the people who went on strike. These were Bolnes Wionskowicz uh, in Katowice Steelworks, Dnia Nadzień in Wrocław and Niezależny Service Informacyjny in Gdańsk. Soon there were weeklies and monthlies. Apart from the national-wide papers like the Godnik Mazowsze or Solidarność in Gdańsk, various journals associated with a given milieu became, uh, uh, began to come out. In 1982, despite the difficult condition and depleted printing facilities, the underground press, uh, underground press flourished. Publications were prepared mainly by people who were only then learning the skill and knew little about professional publishing. However, their work and ingenuity were recognized even by professional printers. In the first issues of magazines, which saw the light of the day soon after the 13th of December, one could read protests against declaring martial law, legal documents on its illegitimacy, letters written by internees, and appeals for passive resistance. Also, there were instructions, decalogues, and code of conduct of in the martial reality, as well as practical rules of conspiracy. Later, secret uh, communications from the in internment camps and uh, reports from uh, Poetrooms were also published. In the spring of 1982, as people were getting used to the gloomy reality of the martial law, qualities, ontologies, literary and cultural magazines began to come out. In April 
uh, in April 1982 in Warsaw, the first issue of Wezwanie, a literary magazine, was published. Later, other magazines of news, literature, and opinion saw the light of the day. Uh, for example, Jarno, Scorpion, and Nowe Zapis. In the following years, uh, more literary magazines uh, also were founded, for example, Obecność, Arka, uh, Kultura, Niezależna and others. Uh, magazines on literature and culture informed readers about independent art exhibition, uh, theater performances, literature readings and new uh, publications. They featured book and exhibition reviews they in endorsed an exchange of ideas and free-spirited people in a dispirited country, a haven for those who did not want to support of, of this, uh, of, uh, to support the system. However, as time passed, the number of the publications went down. This was the outcome of weariness, lack of enthusiasm and market saturation, but also the conditions after the martial law was lifted. The production increased again by the end of, by the, end of the uh, 18th. Uh, it was then that a new generation became active and eagerly set to publish uh, their own magazines. Without doubt, uh, their, youthful, their youthful rebellion, typical of their age, rejection of authorities and or opposition towards all norms played an important part. The generation which entered adulthood in the 18th differed significantly from the one that began its opposition activity a decade earlier. It did not experience the war or Stalinism. In 1989, as a result of the political situation, the number of the titles published grew remarkably and picked in May 1989, when just before the historic election, there were uh, 63 new papers coming out. They were published both of the independent as well as state-owned printing houses. Soon, certain titles of the underground press, whose task was considered to be accomplished, were shut down. However, the independent publishing, publishing still involved due to many factors. Apart from the political and social changes, there were generational ones as well. Also, the printing technique involved from machine copying primitive spirit and protein duplicators to copying machines and offsets. The, the dynamics of production as well as social demand were changing. Some magazines were short-lived over existed longer. However, each became part of the history and independent publishing. The underground Journals played an important role in awakening and raising the awareness of the nation. It is, uh, if it wasn't for the independent press passed from hand to hand, it would be much harder for the opposition milieu to consolidate. The second circulation in Poland challenged the information monopoly of the communists and their policy of blocking all content inconvenient with the current ideology. It also revealed the true inconvenient for the authorities and played an important role in preserving the national identity of Poles. Fighting communists with the free world did not originate in Poland. It took place earlier in the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia, and subsequently it developed in the other countries of the Eastern Bloc. However, it was in Poland the circulation had the broadest reach. To, pr to prove its scope in the 70s and 80s, we may quote statistical data. They were 5,500 5, uh, 5, 5, 5, underground magazines, while in Czechoslovakia there were 800 in Hungary 40 and 30 in the German Democratic Republic. As for books, there were 6,500 titles 
published outside the official circulation. In Czechoslovakia, uh, 900 and even fewer in the other countries of the bloc. Moreover, it was in Poland only the advanced technique, techniques were used on a large scale, which translated into, begin, into high edition. Using duplicators uh, was a characteristic feature of the Polish anti-communist opposition. As a result of independent publishing, did not only a uh, narrow cycle of readers, which was the case uh, in other countries of the bloc, but a broader audience of parenting, not only in the, in the big cities, but, but also in towns, yet another term which distinguished Polish second circulation from some is that abroad. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. And now I invite our third lecture, um, Dr. Saulius Vasilyowskus, a writer and literary scholar working as the, at the Institute of Lithuanian Literature and Folklore. And his um, lecture is entitled Official Literary Magazine and Self-Publication of Younger Generation, Case of Pergale and Siedemas. Uh, Dr. Saulius Vasilyanskus, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, um, the organizers, for all their efforts in making this important project a reality. It's nice to participate in it, and uh, uh, now I will begin. So my pre presentation consists of three parts. First of all, I will briefly go through the historical context, highlight uh, some of the more important dates and events, and discuss the general situation of the literary press in the Soviet era Lithuania. In the second part, I will present the literary magazine Pergale, which was published as the most important official literary publication during the Soviet period. And in the third part, I will present the alternative monthly magazine of the youth, uh, Setinas, which was self-published and avoided censorship. In discussing these magazines, I will concentrate uh, mainly on the late 80s and the early 90s in order to compare how we reacted to the time of upheaval, the atmosphere of liberation, and the path of the Lithuanian state towards independence. I will start with a brief uh, uh, remark of the importance of the press in the Lithuanian history. The press, like the language, uh, has been particularly important because of the complex uh, historical circumstances, uh, the prohibition of Lithuanian press in the second half of the 19th century and the occupations of a country in the 20th uh, century. Through the press, attempts were often made to preserve, uh, preserve and, if necessary, revive both uh, language and freedom. The first Lithuanian newspaper, Sushrand Purpose, at the end of the 90th, uh, 90th uh, century, awakened the nation, mobilized Lithuanians, cared for the de development of the Lithuanian language and its prestige, and praised Lithuanian uh, culture and folklore. Overall, the importance of the press in Lithuania had always uh, been high, and it had grown especially during national upheavals and liberation movements. Now let's talk about, um, take a brief, brief look at the history of Lithuania in the Soviet era. After a period of independence in the interwar, Lithuania was first occupied by the Soviets in 1940. This was followed by three years of Nazi Germany occupation before the Soviets occupied Lithuania for a second time and established themselves here for long. During this period, some Lithuanian writers emigrated to West, some went to Moscow or further away in Russia. From there, they later returned and began to build the foundation of the Soviet Lithuanian literary field. Some were soon exiled to gulags, some decided to go into a forest and die as fighters for the freedom of Lithuania. Some other important uh, dates, um, as you see, are well known, but I would like to single out one specific date uh, to Lithuania. After the process of modernization of literature, especially poetry, what took place in the 70s and the beginning of the 80s, in 1972, a young man, Roma Skalanta, self-immolated in public in the square protesting against, against the Soviet system. This event led to protests and demonstrations, which were suppressed by the regime, much tighter control and censorship. 
This was followed by stagnation and more intense processes of liberation began only during Gorbachev's uh, perestroika. And now let's turn to the cultural and literary press of the Soviet Lithuania. On the screen, you can see, of course, not all, but the more important publication and pair of their first issues. After the uh, Soviet occupation of Lithuania, the publications of the interwar period ceased to be published and new publications were set up to bring together Soviet Lithuanian authors. Of course, cultural magazines were also published in the dias diaspora. You can see three of them uh, at the bottom of the table, Aide, Matmenis and Takirachi, but they were officially forbidden here in Lithuania. Uh, the most important of the literary publications established in the Soviet Lithuania were Pergale and Literatura Irmanas, which were launched at the beginning of the Soviet period. In the 1965, Kulturos Bare was introduced, and in 1967, primarily of the initiative of young writers who gathered in Kaunas, the newspaper Namunas was found. Namunas' significance in the modernization and liberalization of Lithuanian poetry, literature, and art could also be the subject of a broader discussion. It is ironic that the magazine founded on the initiative of the Lithuanian Writers' Union and the Committee of the Komsomol Center followed a rather liberal line until the beginning of the 80s with a number of articles covering the news of Western culture, especially music. Many new, new publications were launched during the general upheaval of the Saudis movement. New magazines, cultural and literary almanacs were published but many of them were temporary and ceased to operate after the restoration of independence. After the collapse of Soviet Union, new publications were set up or those that had existed between the wars were uh, revived, establishing a dialogue with the independent Lithuania of the interwar period. Some of the cultural publications that were active during the Soviet period continued their activities after independence. Some of them changed their name or title or format, and some of them uh, changed their editors. When I was uh, choosing which publication to talk about, I considered at least several options. In the end, I decided um, on Pergale and Setinas because both of them were significant in their own vein. They, but one of them ran throughout all the Soviet era and um, uh, that is, it worked within the framework, framework of ideology. And the other one, Setinas appeared at, at a time when bolder freer speech was needed, while the official ones were still rather afraid of speaking out despite the de decreasing censorship. I chose the magazine to show their difference, but also hoping to find some some similarities. Let's start with Pergole. The magazine um, uh, with this title was founded in 1942 by Lithuanian writers who had fled to Soviet Union, but at first it was just a literary addition to the newspaper of the Red uh, Army uh, 16th Lithuanian Division. Later, two issues of the literary monarch were published under the same title, and finally in 1945, a comprehensive monthly magazine was launched in, in the Soviet uh, occupied country. Pergola was a so called thick magazine, a type of magazine common in, in the Soviet Union. Similar magazines existed uh, in other Soviet republics. On the screen, you can see magazines of this type uh, published in the Baltic states. In short, uh, these magazines were considered prestigious and their publica publications helped authors to establish themselves in the official li literary field. The status of such journals uh, was raised by directives from Moscow. For example, in 1947, Antanas Venslova, a poet who held a high position in the new government, in a letter to Roma Shermaitis wrote, I quote, if the editorial board of Pergola meets today, please inform them that in the Moscow Writers' Union, magazines are now regarded as the main indicator of literary life, end of quote. From the point of view of ideological control, having such a single important journal meant, uh, meant uh, facilitating the control of the literary field. So uh, Pergola published literary texts and translations of various journals, uh, as well as interviews, essays, different eco documentaries, literary and cultural political news. For, uh, for young authors, publication Pergola was like a big step towards a first book. 
The solid size of the magazine also allowed the publication of very long prose work, sometimes even an entire novel, and a lot of attention to literary criticism, which was very important in terms of the literary process and its development. The editors of the magazine have changed uh, several times. Uh, all of them were men, uh, although this situation was not an exception, contrary to the general tendency of many literary magazines of that time. The longest serving editor of the magazine was the famous poet Argimantas Baltakis, who belonged to the generation born in the 1930s and had matured during the harsh years of Stalinism. Baltakis came to the editorial office during the Khrushchev store and played a double game. On the one hand, he had uh, to pay tribute to a political censorship, and on the other hand, sometimes when he felt the atmosphere was freer, he would allow a more daring, more modern text, but did not reflect the expectations of ideology to pass. Baltakis, um, remember, I quote, if we introduced some challenging, uncomfortable material, we would include something at the front of the magazine to ward off criticism. And if someone started to complain that the magazine was going beyond ideological limits, I would point my finger at the introductionary text dedicated, for example, to the anniversary of the party congress, or the routine commer commemoration of uh, the anniversary of Lenin, end of quote. Here are a few examples of more meaning meaningful publications in Pergola in Soviet time. Um, first, in 1949, the essay Sukilosos uh, by Kazis Borota, a writer who confronted the regime, was persecuted and imprisoned. This publication led to, to the temporary withholding of the magazine's printer. In 1968, a debate of the inner monologue in prose took place, influencing the liberalization of prose. At the same time, extracts from James Joyce's Ulysses were published. In 1971, Sriptiz, a novel by the Jewish Lithuanian writer Zvok Asmeras, was published. It was a uniquely modern and surreal novel in that time and caused the author a lot of trouble until he finally emigrated to Israel in 1972. In 1986, the novelist Romaldas Granauskas published his short novel, Gvanimus Poklavu, and two years later, the writer Van, Van de Gneiter published uh, Shermanis. The critics called these works prophets of national literary rebirth. There were, of course, <clears throat> many, many more significant publications, but the biggest accumulation of them came at the end of uh, the Soviet era as the atmosphere became more liberal. So the um, text from 1988 onwards can be divided into several types. First, due to censorship, they were not published in the year they were written. For example, such a short novel, Kristalina's Prusia, by the novelist Jose Saputis, uh, was written at the end of the 1970s, but published it on only in 1989. Second, uh, works that will remain in the history of literature reflecting, reflecting the reality of the Soviet era. For example, the novel by a modern novelist Richard Gavalis, Memoir of a Young Man, published in 1989. Third, um, the literature of uh, the Lithuanian diaspora, which was finally revealed, uh, like uh, a very modern novel, Balta Drobule, by Antana Schema. And the, uh, some emigre poets um, like uh, Henry Kasnagis, Kazis Bradunas, Bernardas Brajones, Alfonsas Nikanilunas, and others um, were published uh, officially. Uh, fourth, uh, exil uh, Gulag literature, uh, which has previously been uh, taboo. Um, for example, Grinkevichute's Memoirs of Exile as a corner cornerstone publication of the period. Fifth, uh, uh, philosophical text reflecting on Lithuanian national identity and language. Um, sixth, uh, uh, various diaries written during the Soviet period or memoirs reflecting on that period. And the last discussions commence on the time of the Saudis uh, movement. So, uh, however, it should be added that alongside these important publications, some of pro-Soviet works uh, that was also published, and the commentaries and co accompanying uh, the publications are sometimes characterized by an excessive ideological zeal, which was, I think, unnecessary at that time. For example, in the publication of uh, Grinkevichute's Memoirs of Deportation, there is a comment that um, 
uh, the editorial board decides to change the name or, or sorry, um, raise the comment, um, uh, that editorial board does not agree with everything that is written in them. And as you can see in a quote. Um, finally, uh, an act uh, testifying of the restoration of independence was published. Soon after that, the editorial board decides to change the name of the magazine to Matty, the name under which it continues to this day and still holds quite a high status in the literary community. On the other hand, the circulation of this guy, which uh, had risen during the upheavals fell dramatically, as you can uh, see in the screen. Now let's move to other magazines, Sitkinas. Um, unlike the uh, Polish station presented by Cecilia Kuta, where in Lithuania there were almost no um, notable examples of literary self-publishing uh, during the Soviet period. So the history of the Young People uh, Culture Monthly Setinas published regularly from 1988 to 1991 with a total of 10 issues can be regarded as a unique, unique story of determination and courage to act independently. Published without censorship under difficult conditions, the magazine broadened cultural blue horizons, instilled freedom of thought, and led the way towards a free democratic national community. The introduction to a first issue of a magazine articulates with civically, civically responsible and ideological open position, position of the publishers. I quote, the situation when we are standing at the abyss at the, and the nation's survival is hanging on a fleet requires us to mobilize our force to search for weaponites us and help us to survive with honor. We do not claim a monopoly of truth, but invite dialogue and discussion." End of quote. The magazine was founded by an ambitious group of friends who graduated from Vilnius University in 1985 with degrees in the studies of painting language and literature. Together, they attended young writers uh, circle at university led by the famous poet Marcellus Martinaitis and continued to be friends after their studies. It should be added uh, that the members of the editorial board were not alone. They communicated with intellectuals of the older generations, maintained contacts with the underground and corresponded with the diaspora. The process of preparing Satinas began in 1987 with the first issue appearing years later. Although the organizers had received offers to publish this magazine officially, they strictly refused to do it because of censorship. The magazine was published irregularly because of difficult conditions. The texts were typed on a typewriter and then secretly reproduced by rotogravure printed, printing. It was agreed in the editorial office that the other members of the editorial board of Setinas would not know where the printing was taking place, only the one who was taking it to the secret place would know. The first issues of a publication coincided with significant events. The editorial team look, uh, took the first issue to the March of Rock in the summer of 1988. Uh, this event was part of a singing revolution spreading ideas of Philippine independence movement among the youth. And the second issue was taken to a founding Congress of the Lithuanian Freedom Movement at the Vilnius Palace of Concerts and Sports. In total, 10 issues of Setinas appeared. The, the material for the 11th issue was almost collected, but it do, did not appear. Um, so uh, what could have been um, the editorial team's main motives and reason for publishing such a magazine? Although in some republics of the Soviet Union and in Moscow itself, there were signs of liberation in that period, including cultural press, various thematic and stylistic experiments, in Lithuania, the press at the end of 1987 was not yet so open and daring as maybe it could be. Before the societies, the official press still staged at the time of the revolution with the renewal of the Soviet regime and stressed the importance of Leninist traditions in the period of the transformation. Some writers of the older generation had, had, had long doubted the possibility of the collapse of the Soviet Union and expressed their doubts publicly. Even a number of new cultural and literary publications were launched during the period of, under discussion, we still follow the path of compromise with the ideology. For example, poet Vitas Donis, an active organizer of literary initiatives uh, who kept his distance from the system for a long time, 
even agreed to join um, the Communist Party in order to be able to publish the new culture magazine in the end of Soviet period, such a compromise stance was complete, completely unacceptable to the editors of Setinas. The principle of uh, Setinas was not only to talk, but also to act, not to participate in public uh, policy, but to act on a true culture by reflecting on the past and proposing guidelines for the future. Uh, you can see uh, two quotes from interviews with Satina's editors um, um, pointing out the, the motives to publish. So um, that was published in Satina's. For the sake of time, I won't elaborate it on the specific publications, but I will try to identify a few thematic and problematic axes uh, that characterize them. This would be uh, the history of the nation, Lithuanian identity, culture and memory, attention to the legacy of the interwar period, and the vision of the Soviet period and its impact on society, Lithuanian culture in the diaspora, which was silent during the Soviet period, the experience of deportations and um, uh, the partisan resistance. Various authentic archival documents have been published in Setinas, excerpts from diaries, partisan poetry, letters from the deportees have been made public. It's worth to emphasize that Grinkevich Uta's deportation memoirs appeared in Setinas at about similar time, time but even slightly, slightly earlier than in Pergole. It should also be stressed that some of the publications provoked established evol evaluation of literature and biographies of writers not necessarily emphasizing only the positive side of their work uh, without idealizing their or creating national idols. It's worth to add that Setinas uh, spread uh, from hand and, uh, to hand, got a lot of reactions, interviews, and even reached the Lithuanian diaspora. In 1989, the Lithuanian Writers' Union's Literary Studies and Criticism Commission recognized Setinas as the most outstanding literary phenomenon of the air and awarded its publisher the Lithuanian Critics Award. So why did such, such a great magazine stop? Of course, one could say that the brave initiative naturally fell into decay, but we can try to identify some reasons. Uh, first, uh, could be Lithuania, Lithuania regained its independence, the press became free, but public attention to culture and literature began to decline. The need and re re relevance of such self-published publication decreased. And one of uh, the more active members of the editorial board, Darius Kolis, became the Minister of Culture and Education, which clashed with the editorial board position of staying away from the government and official institutions. And I would like to end with, with a very brief uh, conclusion. Pergola was an official magazine that ran throughout all the Soviet era. The editorial, uh, editorial board of the magazine oscillated between aesthetic and politics, and in 1988 and 1989, it was still quite compromising, paying not so small tribute to the regime. In contrast, Setinas was published without censorship, so the publications were border, there was no duality, no unnecessary ideological stance. The Pergola editorial board decides to change its name to Matt, and with this title, the magazine continues to this day and still takes an important place in the field of Lithuanian literature. But the editorial board of Setinas, after the restoration of Lithuania independence, decided that the magazine had already fulfilled its mission and that it would be no longer relevant to publish it under the conditions of the free press. To sum up, both Pergola and Setinas fulfilled their missions and helped to pave the path, the path of freedom reflecting the past and discussing the future. However, from the perspective of today, Setinas deserves a little more respect and praise for its openness and uncompromising position in that time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Uh, you uh, right now we are hosting the, the exhibition, so it, it will me, be now easier to present the uh, Lithuanian panel for me to our audience after this lecture. But let me express my uh, big thank you to all 
contributors or uh, all my colleagues who uh, have uh, prepared uh, the presentations and the material and uh, presented them uh, here uh, and in this way shared your knowledge and experience in, that comes from your research uh, with uh, our audience. Uh, maybe let me. Oh, oh, oh I can't. I can't um, uh, share the screen uh, with the with the site now. But this is the project site website. Um, uh, Litmac EU. So you can see. You can watch there um, the videos from the uh, first lecture, which was devoted to the situation in Slovenia and Italy, and. Um, as I said, our uh, the recording from our lecture will be soon available. So I suggest that you uh, maybe come to see us again to listen to the to all presentations and then uh, publish uh, send us a question. Um, and um, let me announce the third lecture, which will be held in March next year. Uh, it will present the situation in Hungary and German uh, Democratic Republic. So again, East European Literary Magazines, 1945-2004 in Hungary and uh, East uh, German, uh, German uh, Democratic uh, Republic, so-called DDR, in, not so-called, but in German. Uh, so thank you again for joining us today at this um, at this nice uh, and informative uh, online lectures. Once again, thank you uh, to all. I send say hello, thank you to all uh, our lecturers and authors of the presentations and lectures. And I thank you uh, everyone for joining us today. Uh, again, a special thanks to Belletrina to the academic press, Belletrina, for organizing this whole session and um, also by uh, for the technical support offered by your academic press to us presenters. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. And bye. I wish you a nice Christmas, uh, Merry Christmas, and all the best in the coming year 2023 and see you again on the third lectures.